content for 12 year olds. I know we're supposed to kind of make our talk suitable for that audience, but this is a pretty brutal topic. And we're gonna cover a lot of things that are really uncomfortable to talk about. Um, so things like, you know, sexual assault and, uh, well, terrorist beheadings and other things that are coming up here. So if this is offensive to you, I totally understand if you get up and leave. Um, just putting that warning out there so everybody knows. So my name is Randy Lee Harper, and I'm here to talk to you about fighting online harassment. There have been some great talks here about community, and this is kind of about community, except it's talking about community interactions and when they go toxic, which usually leads to harassment. So I'm gonna tell you my story, but then we're gonna get into a few different case studies and some of the work I've been doing. Um, I have a lot of new stuff to talk about. So I have given a similar talk at a couple different conferences, but I flew halfway across the world for this, so I kind of stepped up my game and I have a lot more data in here to share. So I'm gonna ask that you don't take any pictures and post them to Twitter. Or if you do, don't tag my name. Don't tag my name on Twitter at all right now because people are name searching me and you will probably get harassed, especially if you're a woman or a person of color. It is an unfortunate reality of social media at this time. So I have a really hard time answering when someone asks me what I do. It hasn't been a problem in most other places, but a lot of people here don't know me, which is kind of great. But it's complicated. The short version is that I'm an activist who writes code. I've been an engineer for 15 years. I've been a system administrator, a developer, a DevOps engineer, a semi-professional competitive gamer, and an, an open source developer. I used to be part of the FreeBSD project, and I was a source committer there working on the installer. When we talk about these case studies and design, I'm gonna be telling you why online harassment and talking about it is important. And this isn't really a talk about feelings, but I need you to connect with the issue. Because normally we think about online harassment as just being a couple of mean words on the internet. You know, going out and calling someone names or getting into a fight, and it's really a lot more serious than that, and it can have serious real world implications. So my story isn't that unique. There's a lot of people that this has been happening to. It could happen to anyone in this room, especially women, especially people of color, because those are the people that tend to be targeted. So, getting started. I probably should have put this in the warning slide, but spoiler alert, I'm gonna talk about a movie. <laughs> who here has seen Kick-Ass? Anybody who didn't raise your hand, I'm sorry, but the movie's been out a couple years, so I don't feel that bad about this. <laughs> uh, the premise is there's this nerdy teenager and he loves comic books and he thinks, why aren't there superheroes in the real world? So he puts together a costume and he goes out and starts patrolling the streets and he encounters this bad person doing a bad thing and so he's like, I'm just gonna wander in here and try to help. He gets the crap beat out of him and then he gets hit by a car you know, just to top all this off. So he wakes up in the hospital, as one does after they get the crap beat out of them and get hit by a car. And he has these new superpowers. He can't feel pain. So he's like, okay, cool. I'm gonna keep going with this. And he's this huge dork who's always making all these mistakes, but he has the best of intentions. Fortunately, his villains aren't very smart either. He gets into battles on MySpace. This is also how he gets, he gets people to ask him for help. He has a social media presence. This is kind of my story, but without so much of the violence. But I've got better costumes, and my superpower is coding drunken pearl. <laughs> so this all starts back in September of 2014. This thing called Gamergate happened. And it's really pretty complicated, but the short version of it is, there was a woman who was a game developer. She had a bad relationship, an abusive boyfriend. She broke up with him, and he started a rumor that she was sleeping with game developers for review, or I'm sorry, game journalists for reviews. This gave all of the men who play video games who are angry at women an outlet for their rage. So they all targeted her. She had to flee her home. 
She went, ran across the country. She was in hiding. She was getting constant threats. Her life was disrupted. Her family was getting threatened. And I was kind of watching all of this from the sidelines on Twitter. I didn't really know her at that point. I didn't know anything about Gamergate. So I went and read the Wikipedia page. And I saw people saying to her, you're not actually getting threats. You're making this up. You want the attention. This is when I decided to say something. And maybe it wasn't the most graceful way of doing things. But I posted to the Gamergate hashtag on Twitter saying, we should believe women when they, when they say they're getting threats. You see, I didn't used to be a feminist. I was in tech. I was senior level. I worked really hard to get to where I was. And I didn't really realize there was a problem until I was hanging out with some of my developer friends, probably like my late 20s. And I was laughing about some of the death threats I was getting. And they look at me in horror. You guys don't get those too? And it turns out they don't. <laughs> and that I've been dealing with this like all of my life and had no idea. So I am fully aware of the crap that women get on the internet, especially if they're loud, especially if they have very strong opinions that they love to voice. So from now on, this talk's gonna get pretty brutal. Um, and so I'm gonna show you pictures of my dogs because this is gonna be heavy and I don't want people to walk out of here depressed and sad. It's gonna be very emotionally confusing for you. <laughs> because I'm going to say these terrible things, and then you're going to see an adorable picture of my dog, and you're going to want to laugh, but you're going to feel bad about it. And it's okay if you laugh. I will understand. This was done intentionally. And also, I just like messing with people. <laughs> this is my dog, Leo, wearing a bucket on his head. I would like to think that if he was a superhero, this would be his costume. So... I told Gamergate that we should believe women when they say they're getting harassed. And overnight, I got thousands of messages on Twitter sent to me. Everything from, you're fat and terrible and you should kill yourself, to I'm going to rape you, to women don't actually get harassed. Show us proof. <laughs> <laughs> so I tried responding to some of these because that's what I did on Twitter at that point. I mostly talked to my friend and some people on open source. And when people tweet at you, you respond. It's a lot easier when you've only got like four or 5,000 followers. <laughs> um, it gets a little bit intense when you get thousands of messages sent at you all saying the same thing. Eventually you get tired of copying and pasting the same responses. <sighs> so eventually this ended in me sitting in bed at three in the morning in the dark, staring at my phone while Adam Baldwin, the Adam Baldwin from Firefly and Chuck, was asking me if I was a social Marxist. To this day, I do not know what that means, but I assume it has something to do with being a woman on the internet that has opinions. <laughs> and it was surreal. So I don't really back down from a fight easily. This is not me, but it could be. This is actually my profile picture on Skype. <laughs> Women on the internet with opinions that are vocal get attacked a lot, and we get used to it. And I'm willing to fight back. I mean, I've been on IRC since the early 1990s, so I'm used to trolling, and I'm used to people being rude. And I'm a gamer. Tech can be sexist, but professional gaming, if you're a woman that just completely wrecked these guys, they're really upset. So you get a lot of things screamed at you. But even with that background, I had this moment where I was staring at my phone in the dark, having a conversation with Adam Baldwin, and thinking, what is this? How do you deal with this? Why is this famous person like sticking his followers on me? I'm just a DevOps engineer on Twitter. Don't you have like a movie to work on? So I was watching these tweets scroll by faster than I could even read them. I mean, they told me I was fat, that I was lying, that I was going to get raped, that I just wanted attention, that I should kill myself. And my heart was racing. I was feeling a little bit nauseated because I didn't know how to deal with this. I wasn't prepared. I mean, what should I do? Should I turn off my phone? I mean, I've got a meeting in like four hours then. Maybe I should just delete my Twitter account. That would be the reasonable reaction, but I am not a reasonable person. I got angry, and so I started yelling louder. 
something clicked and I wasn't really sure if I was angry at them or angry at myself for even considering leaving and being quiet. So there's this mob of people that don't like me, so what? It's like another day that ends in Y. I mean, what could they do anyways? Because it's just the internet, it's just mean words. So I go on with my life and every morning I wake up, I make my coffee, because I was living in Seattle and that's what you do. I check my email, oh yay, more death threats. I log on to Twitter, can't see anything my friends are telling me because it's just completely flooded. And I would just sit there and block users and block users and block users without actually responding to any of them because it, they couldn't even spell. They're not gonna understand anything I tell them. But it wasn't even making a dent. I did this for a month. I would wake up and I would just be angry and I would go to work angry every day, which actually wasn't that much different from normal because I am a Perl developer. <laughs> <laughs> so, one day I came home from work and I was just so done with everything. I was so mad. And I had this bottle of tequila that my coworkers had given me. And I drank the entire thing. It was beautiful tequila. And then, drunk Randy made a good decision. I logged onto Twitter and the usual trash fire was waiting for me. So I decided to replace them with a very tiny Perl script. Drunk Randy is way smarter than Sober Randy according to my comments in that code. <laughs> you can understand this Perl, it's amazing. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that Perl script and how it worked, but the premise of it is that it blocked all of the Gamer Gators and it was exceptionally effective. Suddenly I could use Twitter again. And I talked about it on Twitter and other people that were getting attacked by them because it wasn't just me, they were going after lots of people. They were like, you need to share this. So I open sourced it and I put it on GitHub, which is a really scary thing to do. I'd been a committer for FreeBSD before in small capacity, but I'm a woman starting an open source project that blocks a bunch of angry people who are going to see the open source project and then rip apart my code, drunken Perl code. So I'm expecting to just get my code slammed, but you know what, whatever, it works. I was doing DevOps at the time, that's basically how you do your job anyways. As long as it gets stuff out the door, you're fine. So I open sourced it and I shared the block list via a third party service called Block Together. So other people who don't know how to run Perl, you know, like normal people, they could sign up to this block list and it would block all these people for them. And then things got really weird. <laughs> Leo's such a great dog. <laughs> it blew up overnight. Thousands of people signed up. It was all over the news. Not just like in blogs, but they ran an article in Newsweek on me. Vice ran articles about this dumpy 200 line Perl script. The New York Times editorial board endorsed it. This is not where I expected that tequila night to go. This was probably more unsettling to me than that conversation with Adam Baldwin, because I was not expecting this to ever happen with any open source project, much less you know something I hacked together in like 20 minutes. So when I was talking to all these reporters, I was honest about how I wrote it, which is why my tequila shenanigans are now forever immortalized in print media. But hey, Pearl was relevant again for the first time in a decade, so that's great. <laughs> So I was freaking out, but the media was good because people were hearing about it and they were signing up for it. And I got so many great emails from people saying, I was about to leave, but this saved me. I'm able to talk to my friends again. You know, I was having such a hard time and now I can go on the internet and you know, just talk to my friends on Twitter and things are great. And that was kind of awesome. I sort of liked helping people. That was new for me. So that was going great, but then things got bad. It started with legal threats. See, in this Perl script, Drunk Randy has really good variable names, like sheeple and monsters. And they claimed that this was defamation and that they were going to sue me over variable names. This is so great. And then I got told that I was going to be sued for blocking them because it was a violation of their First Amendment rights. <laughs> I've received so many legal threats to this day for that one right there. Then they got confused because um, the way this works is there's a source list of users this was all based off of, and that file was called Blacklist. 
And they're like, this is an industry blacklist. You are blacklisting people from the gaming industry. Like, no, sweetheart, that, that's a software term. So I had to explain that to them. And then they started digging into my life. They started calling my mom at two in the morning. They started calling my friends. My employer got a flood of emails saying, this woman is terrible and she is violating the law and she's writing Pearl and you need to get rid of her. FreeBSD got emails telling me that they needed to fire me because that's how open source works. <laughs> I had to stop checking my mail because people were sending me random stuff in the mail that you really don't want to get. There was one person who we found was wiring together explosives who was planning on sending it to me overseas. There was a guy who showed up outside my office at work, took a selfie, posted it on Twitter, continued to post maps to my office on Twitter, and then one of his friends said, you should bring a knife next time, and he said, that's a good idea. Then, one night, the cops showed up at my house. They had received a call saying there was a hostage situation. This is known as being swatted. People call in false threats, so presumably a SWAT team will descend, you'll get your door knocked down, and people have died doing this way. Dogs often die this way. I knew it was coming because I'd been monitoring the worst parts of the internet. I had written more Pearl scripts. <laughs> And so I had known a couple months before, I just didn't know when it was gonna happen. And so I went to the police station, I had to fight to file a police report. I was like, look, here's the proof, here are the archives. This is where they say this is going to happen. And so they let me file a report after I yelled and screamed for quite a while. And that's the only thing that saved a SWAT team from actually knocking down my door. Instead I opened up my door and there's six cops standing there. Hey, we heard that somebody's about to die here. But you know, we saw that your address was listed in our system as you know, possibly being false complaints, so that's why we're not knocking down your door. The worst part about this was for three months I had to wear pants every day because I didn't know when the cops were going to be showing up. <laughs> and this was all over an open source project, which is still like absurd to me. Then Breitbart kicked in. If you haven't heard of Breitbart, they are a right-wing conservative tabloid. They would not describe themselves as a tabloid, but that's exactly what they are. Extremely sexist, extremely racist. And they, just started to start, they decided to start writing about me because, you know, I am a horrible feminist who was you know, doing terrible things to men on the internet, apparently. After these Breitbart articles came out, I had to block more people because suddenly there's all these weird conservatives tweeting at me. Now, I won't defend myself or any of the weird accusations they make because that's a losing game. It's something I always refuse to do. So he wasn't getting a rise out of me, this journalist. So he started tweeting pictures of my dead sister with a Nazi flag Photoshop behind her. And then he wrote an article about my 13-year-old son, who I kept out of all of this. Like, nobody really knew about him, but he dug up this information. <sighs> During all of this, I was laid off from my job. And due to a legal situation currently ongoing, I cannot say the reason I was laid off, but I will say that they said it was because they were just laying off game teams. Just take that how you will. Um, I wasn't getting enough sleep. At that point, I was working two jobs before I was laid off, so I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And I was a senior DevOps engineer in San Francisco. If I had wanted to continue doing that, I could have. The job market there is amazing for that position. But I really don't like writing puppet manifests. It's not that interesting and it's not that fun compared to this. So I decided to leave my career. Instead I went and I did the scariest thing I could possibly think of and that's to go crowdfunded. So now like 600 people pay my bills so I can work on this stuff full time. Then Patreon, my crowdfunding source was hacked and people posted the addresses of all my supporters. I had went out and notified them before this was actually made public, so they knew, and I was worried that they were gonna cut their funding because suddenly they were in danger, but it's mostly white dudes in tech who are supporting me, which is kind of cool, and they're not in as much danger, and they kind of know that, so a lot of them just doubled down, and suddenly I was able to afford health insurance, and that was great. <laughs> 
So I had to leave where I was living because it was San Francisco and I'm no longer an engineer and I cannot afford those insane rents. So I moved to Portland and I went into hiding. Nobody knows where I live now, not even my mom. I have no bills in my name. My address is not even in my GPS. I have something else that's kind of close to my house. I have to be really careful about tweeting where I'm going to be. If I tweet that I'm, well, like here, I can be a little bit better about it. I can say I'm at this conference, but normally I don't announce anywhere I'm at until like I've left there, just because there are people who are trying to find me. People have been kicked out of conferences before for showing up to confront me. These are people who have violent criminal pasts. So now at conferences, except for this one, because Australia is pretty rad and I don't really know many assholes out here, um, I, don't, I usually have to have a security escort. So I show up at a conference when I'm going to speak, usually a couple hours beforehand. I go straight to the speaker's lounge. I write my talk, as one does, right before they give it. And then a security escorts me to the room. I give my talk, they escort me back, and I leave. That's my life. I can't talk to my friends on my public Twitter because anybody who is seen talking to me might become a target. It's happened before. I have to warn people not to tag me on Twitter because they might get harassed. Companies and organizations I associate with get flooded with email. If anybody here was at OzCon last year, you might remember the hashtag fun that happened. Gamergate was very upset I was at OzCon. So they flooded the hashtag with all kinds of Breitbart links because that's what one does. And they flooded it with gore and porn and all kinds of terrible things. So the OzCon account used my code to block all of them and they got even madder, it was so great. But it sucked for OzCon. I thought it was hilarious, but I feel bad for them. So I have to warn any conference I'm gonna speak at that this could be happening. So with the live stream right now, we're kind of worried that they haven't, they don't seem to care about LCA, which is weird, because this is a really great conference, but um, we're, we're watching the live stream right now to make sure that they don't find it and start flooding the hashtag here. So far we've been lucky. So I'm never gonna be able to have a normal job again just because any company I associate with gets flooded with email, but I'm okay with all of this because I really love what I'm doing now. And I'm very good at it. I'm happy. Life is weird, but kind of great, despite all the things you just heard. I enjoy poking trolls and kicking beehives. So don't feel bad for me, that wasn't the point of this. One of the worst things anyone can say to me is that they feel sorry for me, because it's kind of missing the point. I went through this, and I've been winning every battle that has come my way. I still have fun. I love trolling people coming after me. I love it. I love it so much. It is the highlight of my day. So I'm going to tell you two funny stories before I move on with this. Um, one has to do with Adam Baldwin and my butt. My butt is internet famous now. After all of the whole, the I'm, you're fat and you know, you should lose weight jokes, I started wearing tight leggings because that seemed the reasonable response. And they would still send me this stuff. So anytime somebody sent me a you're fat comment, I would take a picture of my butt and I would send it to them. You know, like one does. And it kept escalating. And eventually Adam Baldwin came at me. And he's like, Michelle Obama would be ashamed of you, Randy. Why are you being non-compliant? These are the words he used. So it spawned a hashtag called non-compliant butt pics, where everybody sent their, their picture of their butt to Adam Baldwin. And you can still look this up on Twitter now. It's still there. And the best part is it was mostly white guys. So like, <laughs> so you see all these flat butts just on Twitter pointed at Adam Baldwin, and he had a fun day, I'm sure. And now, just the other day, my second story, I have this lovely badge that was made for me by Paul Van Wick. Randy Lee Harper, a legendary purveyor of Updog. I accidentally got added to a group DM, which is like a group chat on Twitter, by a bunch of trolls. They saw who they added. They were trying to add a different Randy, you see. And they were like, oh crap, we just added the anti-harassment person. This is the worst person to have here. So I updogged them twice. <laughs> and of course, sent them pictures of my butt. <laughs> they were very upset with me. This went on for 53 pages. I took an imager album. It's so fantastic. But that's what I do. I troll trolls back, you know, when I'm in the mood for it and when I want to, and because it's fun. So this was my story. 
It's extreme, but it's not unique. This could happen to anybody. And you see, I'm not really anyone important. I am just a DevOps engineer who started talking about things on Twitter and some people didn't like it. I have strong opinions and they really don't like that, but there's tons of people with strong opinions in this room. So I'm sure you all understand what that's like. During all of this though, I didn't really tell you what I do that upsets them other than the butt pics and the up dog. So what do I do? Everything. I started this just wanting to write code, but the problem with being crowdfunded and being able to define your own priorities and do whatever the hell you want is that suddenly you get sucked into everything you can possibly think of. So I work on policies. Um, I talk a lot to companies like Twitter and Facebook and Google about their harassment policies. I work towards platform and API changes because I want third-party developers to have a better ability to create apps to help protect people. Um, I work with law enforcement because law enforcement's really dumb and they have no idea what is happening. True story, police in Silicon Valley did not have email until like five years ago. This is the level of tech they're working with. I do counseling and support for people who are being harassed. And this is usually one-off stuff, like people just DM me and they're like, please help, I'm being attacked, what do I do? And so I'll kind of help guide them through it as well as I can. I am a victim advocate, so I have went with people to the police station and helped help them talk to the police because I've done a lot of work talking to the police and I know how to use the language they understand. Um, I write scripts for flood mitigation, which is usually like one-offs. There's this thing that happens on Twitter called dogpiling. And that's when somebody who has a large follower account will say something bad about you and all of their followers pile on. So I have scripts that help like block a lot of people. Um, I do abuse case escalation. So if people report things to Twitter and like Twitter doesn't act on it and because sometimes their system kicks stuff back, I have the ability to go to Twitter and talk to them and get stuff looked at a little bit more thoroughly. And obviously I do public speaking, which has taken up a lot of my time. I kind of wish it took less, but that's why I come here, so I can get people interested in working on this stuff and then they can go do the public speaking and that would be great. And I collect a lot of data. So I have like a $600 AWS bill right now because of my Redis databases. Don't run Redis in AWS. It is not cost effective. But I have six screens at home and four of them are usually dedicated to monitoring the worst parts of the internet. I have all these scripts I've written that go out there and watch these boards and see who's being targeted. I have alert systems, which will tell me when specific people who are high visibility are getting targeted and I can notify them. So I collect a lot of data and eventually this moved into me collecting a lot of data about communities because I wanted to see if I could predict harassment, if I could watch the way it moved across platforms because that's something we don't do well yet. Harassment campaigns can be organized on Facebook, but orchestrated on Twitter. And the policies don't protect against that. And there's no way to really explain to Twitter support. Well, you see, this is the context, because this is what happened on Facebook, because they're just going to go talk to Facebook. Despite all of this, this really isn't a story of good versus evil. Very few people wake up in the morning and think, I'm going to be a jerk today. Instead, these people they think they're being the hero. They're standing up for something they believe in, and to them, people like me are the bad guy. So I'm trying not to draw that line. Instead, I want to look at the raw data, and I want to create ways for communities to protect themselves. So one of the ways I do this is I look at metadata for different accounts, because looking at text content, especially on Twitter, because it's 140 characters, you can't get a good sense of what somebody actually means there is no metadata for sarcasm. So that's really hard to tell, but instead you can look at things like, who's this person following? Who are they talking to? Is that person talking back to them? Is, is that person immediately block them because that's a negative interaction? But if they talk back and forth multiple times and their mutual follows, that's a positive interaction. That's a really strong positive interaction. So we can use this to kind of build out our ideas of what these communities look like. So one of the communities that I first looked at was Gamergate. And my seed for this is that they were following, mostly, about these six different accounts. So the way my code worked, uh, GG Autoblocker was the name of the script, it would look for people who are following more than two of the accounts. 
If they were, they're probably not somebody I wanted to talk to, so I blocked them. They use a hashtag now, which is not the Gamergate hashtag, it's something else. And occasionally you'll see like anti-Gamergate people posting to the Gamergate hashtag, so that wasn't really a good metric. But this one isn't, somebody, isn't something anybody uses other than Gamergate. But what I saw when I was mapping this community and collecting this data is that it was evolving over time. And this is actually a really interesting side effect of the media, the way media was covering Gamergate, because it was a really big topic in a lot of places. So these other groups, uh, men's right activists, the people who troll Black Lives Matter, um, pickup artists, all different, uh, white supremacists were a big one. They all jumped into the Gamergate hashtag and they started following these other people. And it's not that they believed in this whole ethics in game journalism thing, although it's questionable as to any of them believe this. It's that they saw that these people were getting credibility in the media, or at least they were being talked about, they were getting attention. So these communities started merging. So now that method, not super effective. Instead, I look at who they're targeting. So negative interactions with specific people, which Gamergate tends to target. 14 months later, I just ran this yesterday, I pulled down the original block list for GG Autoblocker, and I update it every couple months, but this is just looking at the first one. 11.6% of those accounts were suspended or deleted. That's a really high number for Twitter. Only 42.4% have been active this year. Which leads me to believe, and obviously I can't prove this, but I think that like half those accounts were sock puppets, accounts that they created you know, just to troll people, and then they just dropped them when they couldn't anymore because of GG Autoblocker. Next I went on because I got contacted by somebody who had infiltrated Al-Qaeda on Twitter. And they were telling me they weren't actually an Al-Qaeda supporter. They were pretending to be because I learned much about in this encounter. Uh, Al-Qaeda has really good propaganda about ISIS, and they were fighting ISIS. So they told me that ISIS was sending out this link to everybody on the internet that they could find, and if somebody clicked this link, it would download a bot onto their computer, just a virus. And they're like, can you give us a list of these accounts? So they gave me one account to start with to see, and I was using Google Translate, but that's really not a good way to do this because it's a lot of religious text, and I don't have the background to understand really what's going on with any of that. So instead, I started looking for images. And I found these images of American soldiers that had been beheaded. And like very gory pictures, American passport next to them, so you could tell. And I was like, okay, anybody who's retweeting this, let's see what they're up to. Let's see if they're like doing more images. Let's see if they're following the same people. And I built up a list of about 5,000 accounts. And these were all ISIS followers. And I discovered some really cool patterns here that I hadn't seen elsewhere. ISIS is really sophisticated on the internet which is surprising. They have botnets. They use IFTT. And this is probably due to the high turnover rate of accounts uh, being suspended for abuse. They were using emoji to signify new account names for them to follow, which is kind of cool, actually, because nobody really looks at emoji and looks for it as being code for something. And I was just watching them on the, and this was probably early last year, so like January of last year, when I pulled all this down. Then recently I found the Brookings ISIS study, and I'll have a link to this at the very last slide too. It's really cool, I highly recommend you read it. It's fascinating data because they look at all the metadata of ISIS on Twitter. And they had an interesting theory that the more insular the ISIS network is, the more extremist they became. So before they started getting suspended, they would occasionally branch out and follow like non-ISIS people. But when they started getting suspended, they pulled in more, and you saw more radical views going on. The problem with all of this is that it attracted mentally ill people, especially in the US, there were a couple cases of this. People who didn't actually believe in what ISIS was peddling, but they're like, ooh, violent images. Let's go out and bomb people. And that happened. So, while we don't really want to suspend those accounts because it does amp up terrorism within ISIS, we also don't want people to be able to access that. So I was talking about this actually here at the bar a couple nights ago, and we were talking about ways to fix this without suspending accounts. And one of the ideas we posited is that there's a hashtag, well, actually there's several hashtags that ISIS uses, and I'm guessing that's how these people found them. What about we just flood those hashtags with like, pictures of puppies? makes it a lot harder to find gory images. So this is a paragraph 
from the report. It's not actually related to online harassment, but I thought it was hilarious. So I'm going to read it in case you can't. In mid-December, ISIS announced that it would ban iPhone products within its territory due to security concerns. In early February, we collected data on a set of 10,000 likely ISIS-supporting accounts using a similar methodology to the overall study and found only a 1% drop in the use of iPhones. So I guess Steve Jobs is really important over there. Um, there was actually talk about how ISIS was developing their own communication network uh, encryption and app on cell phones. And they were developing this for Android because that's actually what the majority of their people use. But they were cutting off a third of their supporters because of the iPhone usage. So I guess that's kind of why that fell through. So this is mapping open platforms like Twitter, where everybody is just kind of this one big glob and you have to sort them out into communities, which is possible and fun. But what about other platforms? that are community focused, like Reddit. Reddit is terrible, it's so bad. Um, the moderation tools are non-existent. And any type of controversial post within a community attracts people from outside that community, people who wouldn't normally be posting there. We need to allow better community segregation. So we need to allow communities to say, okay, I don't want people outside this community posting here, we wanna keep this within the community and have them talk and discuss. So a good example of this is actually, and I don't know if we're going to be able to read this, but um, PHP had a code of conduct thread. And this is a really heated topic within any open source project. Um, a lot of people are very against code of conducts. So I ran some analytics on that thread. And it was really interesting. So a lot of these people were Gamergators, or they posted to Gamergate. Eight, 10 of these had never posted to PHP before. One of those users posted 20 times for a combined comment, thread, a comment score of 109. One also posted to FreeBSD on their code of conduct thread. 12 have posted to Gamergate related subreddits more than they have posted to PHP. Four commenters recently uh, posted recently to, so if you don't know these acronyms, MGTOW is men going their own way, which I really wish they would. <laughs> it's great. If you actually go search this on YouTube, it's all these guys like with crappy cameras in basements. I love it. So uh, MRA, men's rights activists, and PUA, pickup artists. So a lot of these people were posting there. 20 commenters had never commented to any other programming related subreddit. So you're seeing this influx of people coming into this community and they're dominating the conversation. They actually have the most upvotes. And that's because they don't have good ways to say, okay, well, we can see that this other subreddit posted a link over here, and now their users are flooding over here because they're angry about the women. So we need to do a better job of actually fixing this problem. So how can we do that? So I'm gonna go through a couple platforms and talk about ways that I really want this to be improved. And this, this is more to give you ideas of how we can deal with these problems, more so than tell you, hey, let's go do this to Reddit, because we don't have that power. Reddit's probably the one company I haven't worked with at this point. I don't know what their deal is. So one thought is that we give people a community score based on participation, not a site score, a community score. And these threads that might be more controversial, um, we will limit those to a certain quality score. This will keep out people who haven't posted in the community, and that way they have to put effort forward. They have to contribute to the community. They have to be a part of it, and then they can talk about these topics that draw attention. We can do things like provide moderation tools so they can monitor for external links. So for Twitter, this is my favorite platform to talk about, we can mute conversations. I post a tweet saying feminism is awesome. Eight billion people post to that tweet saying no, it's not combined with all the other garbage they usually throw. What if I could just mute that conversation? I don't want to see any replies to that tweet anymore. That ability doesn't exist. Fix search results so that blocks will apply to search. Currently, if you block users and you search a hashtag, you will still see those blocks. I actually found a cool way around this using adblock because they have HTML5 tags, which say that this user's blocked. They just don't filter those results. So using adblock, I was able to filter search results, which is pretty cool. Um, protected accounts, when they have conversations, they, you can still see the other side of that conversation if that person has been protected too, so those people can be targeted. The ability to filter notifications by metadata, like I only want to talk to people who have had accounts that are older than two days. 
that would be a really good way to get rid of a lot of trolling. And last, fix client bugs, because TweetDeck is the worst client in the world. They keep adding new features, and they don't even support mute on it yet. It's all client side and not server side, and I've been trying to get the, to fix this for the past year. This one's fun. So I got invited to Google Ideas, and we were talking about harassment problems on the internet, and it was really cool. I was there with a bunch of other women, like Anita Sarkeesian and Zoe Quinn, and a bunch of other people who were involved in the online harassment stuff. And Google Ideas posted a picture of us and tagged all of us on their Twitter account. I got so much data from that. <laughs> <laughs> because it wasn't just my trolls. Suddenly I had the racist trolls coming at me because there was a black woman there. I was like, ooh, cool. Okay, let's see how this overlaps. And it was really awesome. Uh, the, Google, the guy from Google who ran the account had a little less fun of a time. <laughs> I think we were at Google's office drinking until like one in the morning. Poor guy. Um, fixing suggested videos. So currently if I go watch an Ninja Sarkeesian video, and let's say I upvote it, I shouldn't see videos talking about how much they hate Sarkeesian. I should see other videos of people who like the same things that I like. So let's say I upvoted this. Let's see what other people who have upvoted this video also like. Change that to suggested videos. Comment scoring, very similar to the idea with YouTube. I want people who have positive comment scores on videos like this. Comments on the internet in general. So there's actually a new startup that just came out and they're still creating their product and I've been talking to them and they're amazing. They're called Civil Comments. Upvotes by themselves aren't clear. Upvotes are usually kind of like, I agree with your opinion, upvote. This has two different scores. One is civility. So you can talk to them or you can talk to somebody who doesn't believe the same thing as you, but they're polite about it, and then you can upload them for that. And you can limit based on the civility score, so you get rid of trolls that way, and it's great. They also protect against raids, so if they see links coming in from other sites and people are manipulating votes, they'll just shut that right down. And last, reporting abuse. This is something that nobody does right. We need to have ticket tracking. If you report something for abuse, we need to, the person who reports it needs to have a ticket number. They need to know that it's being looked at. We need to allow them to type in the context of the harassment because a lot of times this stuff happens off the network. It happens on a different site. We need to do typing so we can say that this is actually a threat and you know, this is, they're posting my home address and various things. We need to get drunk when we make these systems. So anytime I go onto a new site, I drink first. I really like drinking. Um, I drink first and then I'm like, okay, I need to report something, how do I do that? That didn't work, nope. Where's the safety box? And if I can't find it, there's something wrong. And we need to have reasonable defaults for reporting. So like with Ask FM, if you report a post, if you actually just wanna block a post, there's a checkbox for reporting it and that's automatically checked and that doesn't make sense. It's gonna give them a high rate of false positives. So step one for all of this is thinking like a jerk. I wanted to use a stronger word, but I'm trying to be good here. What we're doing here is like infosec. We're looking for exploitation, but we're doing this with people and social systems. So there was this dude who created a Kickstarter to make a tool for people who are being harassed. It was the worst idea in the world, and I told him this before he created the Kickstarter. So the people who wanted help would go in and they would use this app, and they'd say, okay, this person is saying mean things to me. Please, people, go help. And people, would, uh, like people who had signed up for this would go and talk to the person saying mean things. But what you usually see is somebody will say a mean thing to somebody, like me. I will say a mean thing back, like I do. And they will delete their comment, which makes me look like the bad guy. It's so easy to game this system. So suddenly, this person who had just been harassed now has a bunch of people coming at them saying, you're a bad person. And we need to be careful of writing systems like that. Luckily, the Kickstarter failed. <sighs> Databases are targeted. So anytime there's a database of harassment victims, there are actually black hat hackers who go after these databases because, hey, these are people who have already been abused, so they're easy targets. There's a new program out called HeartMob, which is kind of similar to the first thing, but not exactly. Um, you create a case and you say, I'm being harassed on this platform, and you can ask for help. I don't really like this idea. It's getting a lot of press and a lot of people are using it and that's great, but how long until a harasser comes up with a fake account? Because you have to authenticate to a, an existing 
Facebook or Twitter to be a person who responds to these cases. It doesn't take much to create a fake account and look like a real person. And then he's gonna go off and find these people who are being harassed and post all of their data anywhere he can find it. Because here, here are people we can go out and poke. Oh, time. Okay, I'm on my last slide almost. All right. Okay, step two, become a superhero. Um, this goes back to the kick-ass theme. So, spoiler, second movie. A bunch more dorky superheroes come in. It's great. All these other people who are like normal people come in and they try to be a superhero and they make mistakes too and it's, it's pretty great and that's what I'm trying to get people to do. I want other people to come in and be superheroes too. They need to know that there is a danger to all of this. That's why I tell my story so you don't walk into this blind, so you don't think, oh, it'll be fine. I don't have to protect myself because these things can affect you in real life. But we need more people, either helping support the people who are out there doing this or writing the code or talking to your company about making better decisions. Last slide. There's no Q&A. I will be available at a bar tonight. <laughs> um, link to the ISIS study, my blog where I talk about harassment sometimes, my GitHub, which doesn't have a lot on it, uh, my organization's GitHub, and my crowdfunding site. That's it. <laughs> Can you turn this off?